I just wanted to remind you that at the American Bandito website, we now have a store page. So if you'd like to support the show, and if you've been enjoying it this season, head on over to AmericanBandito.com and visit the store section. We've got stickers and books and shirts, things like that. So if you uh, would like to support the show, stop on by, get yourself something. Go to AmericanBandito.com and visit the store section. And I want to thank you so much for listening to this show. I hope you are enjoying it as much as I'm enjoying doing it. All right, enough of that. Now, on to the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. I've been playing pop-up interviews that I did at an event called the Hibernation Liberation earlier this year. And one of the last ones that I did at the event was actually two people that came in off the street. Think they might have been a little drunk, not sure. They might have just been enjoying the day. Actually, they say they were. And at first they came up and it was just kind of a joke, which is perfectly fine. But by the end, I think they were kind of fascinated with, like, what I was actually doing. My name's Elliot. Uh, I do uh, prairie and woodland restoration and management. A little invasive species control out in the woods. Helping the environment. Yeah. Hippie. Just doing my part. Okay. Just doing my part. How did you get started doing that? Uh, I was doing it part time after I graduated college with a business. I mean, like, how did you find it? Like after you were like, "This is what I'm going to do." The guy, I knew the guy I'm working for. And I was doing it part time. Got a business degree. Yeah. Offered me a full time job, and I've been doing it for three years now, and I love it. What brings you out here today? Well, I moved into the neighborhood in November, yeah. and we were just out. Enjoying our Sunday. Yeah. Pretty much just Stop. met people, you know. Stopped in. Yeah. So you just saw it passing by. Making new friends. Exactly. Yeah, and so you just moved into the neighborhood. Where from? Where did you used to live? Well, I grew up in DeForest, but then I went to college in Stevens Point. Okay. We lived there for five years, and then I just moved back down here in November. And have you been here this whole time? I, I'm from here. Uh, grew up in Madison my whole life. What side of town? Um, east. I didn't go to East High School. East Side. I went to La Follette High School though. Nice. But I went there. I went there back in the 1900s. So. uh, (laughs) You don't look that old, man. What are you like? uh, 35. 45. And thank you for. You're my new best friend. I love both of you now. You're my two favorite people. So hopefully I want them over. I don't know. They may have completely forgotten about this entire thing and they'll never hear any of this. But still, I think it was kind of a cool thing. Last season, I spoke to the people that run Booth 121 on the east side of Madison. And one of the things that I saw in their store was by the woman that I'm talking to today. My name's Heather Boggs. My creative business is Stitch Boom Bang, which is a pop culture embroidery type of thing. I do mostly portraits. I start with a line drawing illustration and then I transfer that into fabric art. And then by day I work at a nonprofit for affordable housing. After seeing her stuff, I followed her on Instagram and decided that I wanted to talk to her. So both her and I realized we were going to be going to the Madison Zine Fest, which was at the downtown public library. So we met up there to talk to each other. And I, so the first thing I saw was the Hall & Oates portrait and then, uh, of course, looked at all the rest of the stuff. And then I, ever since then, I realized I've been seeing your stuff at different shows and things like that. How did you get started with the portraits? So I like to make things and it's kind of a de-stressor for me. Mm-hmm. And there comes a point, you know, where you got to just get it out of your house. And I had this fear of starting a business because I thought I would do something wrong and that the IRS would come after me or I would do something that was copyrighted and someone would come after me. And I just kind of got over that and jumped in and am like, if you want to come after me, then come after me, (laughs) which I think you have to do. So I just put myself out there and I started with an Etsy and then I did one show and a friend of Leah's saw my stuff at Booth 121 and I hooked up with them and have started putting my stuff out locally. I saw that you would also, you used to do house portraits. Yeah, I still do those actually. A friend of mine is a local realtor and he asked me to start doing customized kind of house portraits for his customers as a gift when he went to closing. Mm -hmm. So I did that initially for him and I've gotten quite a few commissions just by word of mouth from him. And then there was a little piece in the Wisconsin State Journal about that, too. Yeah, I, I don't really put that out there with my business brand because it's kind of a different type of thing. But I do it if people contact me, sure. What was the inspiration behind actually doing the 
I'm going to call them pop culture portraits. Yeah, I, I reference them as pop culture portraits, but it's really just stuff that I loved growing up and that kind of resonates with me. And I have found that, like most people, smile and laugh and kind of get it, or they look at me with a blank stare and are like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I, I just think it's funny to pair, you know, something... 90s rap with a frilly doily. I think it's hilarious. That was kind of the beginning of it, was just that it's funny to put these two things together that don't go together. Mm -hmm. But then I realized how much people really do get sentimental and nostalgic about this stuff. So that's always been kind of a connecting point with people. Mm -hmm. Like when I go to shows in person, I was really surprised mm -hmm. how people are just really touched by some of this stuff. So I refer to it as pop culture, but it's really just stuff that I loved. My favorite one that actually made me laugh, I want to say was Lionel Richie. I really like to do chest hair and mustaches, and he's got both, so. <laughs> stuff you also have kind of like a horror interest yes I love horror movies and I have this obsession with The Shining so I've stitched like almost every scene from that movie and nobody wants it but I just keep doing it because I think it's so funny and like I said I'm a little bit obsessed <laughs> you have like a, a set room that's just full of like scenes of The Shining oh my god you should film them <laughs> Just play the audio in the background and show each embroidered song. like a stop motion with all of the different embroideries that I have. But actually, some of them sell really well, like the twins. People buy that stuff. But I stitched, you know, the bear from that weird scene with the stuffed bear with the guy. And it's like I ended up giving that to a friend because I'm like, nobody gets this and it's weird. So I have to get it out of my life. But yeah, I love horror movies. And the horror characters really also match well with like the frilly vintage linens. It's hilarious. I think it's hilarious. The cool thing about the stitching is it has kind of a raw sort of, well, oddly enough, you and I meeting here at the Zine Fest, it has like a raw, independent, sort of unpublished feel to it. And I really like that when you look at those scenes done in the embroidery stuff. Yeah, I think that my style is definitely minimalistic, but I'm also very DIY. I'm self-taught. Yeah, I don't have any art background. I just kind of get in there and, and scrap it up. What made you choose embroidery? Actually, growing up, my mother did a lot of sewing as for extra money for our family. And so I grew up around that. And I didn't really learn anything from her other than ripping things out. <laughs> she would let me do that. She would give me a seam ripper and say, rip this apart for me. But I never really learned the craft itself. And she did a lot of machine sewing, which machines kind of freak me out because they're so fast. And I'm afraid that I'm going to like sew over my hand or something. So I really like the, the slow, deliberate hand stitching. And I guess the technique, I, I just do a straight, simple back stitch because, again, I just want to keep it very clean and easy and minimal and focus more on the image and the fabric. But, I mean, you can get really intricate with embroidery. You can do like almost a thread painting. And I think a lot of people are looking for that, and it's not really my bag, but I think it's amazing work. I don't even know where to find toilets. You thrift your ass off. That's what I do. And again, like my parents live in Iowa still, and they go to estate sales and get like just boxes of stuff. And I have to go through it, and some of it I can use, and some of it I can't. But I get a lot of stuff at St. Vinny's, I get a lot of stuff at Goodwill. But yeah, it's definitely, you gotta get in there and do some digging. How did you get started in the show? I just did one recently and it terrified the hell out of me. I just decided to do it. It is scary. The first show that I did was the Goodman Center, the Crafty Fair, and that's three blocks from my house. So it was really, it was easy for me and it was a little less intimidating because I had been to the show before. You couldn't talk yourself out of it. There's no justification in three blocks. Couldn't say it's, it's too much effort. I mean, I, could, I walked down there with my stuff. So that was a really easy and good intro for me into the craft show world. And Rosie, who runs that show, is phenomenal. She's super organized and She's just got all, everything in a row, and you show up, and you set up your table, and, you know, sometimes shows don't go that way. So she kind of spoiled me. I thought all shows went that smoothly, and that's not the case. <laughs> but I had a really great first experience with that, and I think it taught me that you just kind of have to jump in if yeah. you want to do it. I did mine, and I'm like, wow, that, that was cool. I want to do another one. And now I'm like, oh, wait, I don't know how to do another one, because Tammy helped me, and she's trying to help me again. But at some point, it's like... 
all right, I got to figure it out for myself. So how do you figure it out for yourself? It's just kind of in my nature to jump in and and make it work. And I spent a lot of time worrying about things. And once I started my business and got things rolling, I realized how silly it is to, you know, spin your wheels worrying when really it's best to just try it and see if it works. So I've tried things and some things haven't worked and I've stopped and you switch gears. And I think when I first opened my Etsy especially, I wanted everything to be perfect. I wanted this many listings and I wanted great photographs and I wanted my prices set. And, you know, you open it up and it's, that's not how life is, you know, and you make changes and you shift gears. And I think that's part of it. That's part of having a creative business. I think I've kind of figured out what people want, what sells, the price point, that kind of thing. But it takes time, you know, I'm four years in now and it took me probably a good year to kind of figure things out. And now I feel like I'm kind of rolling and I still like to try new things and see if it goes anywhere. But I also feel like I figured out the reliables that people want. But I mean, my only advice is to just do it. And if you're scared, just do it. I don't know. I think that when you start to do shows, you start to meet more people and you start to hear about other shows. But Madison is really a great community for DIY and makers and artists. I think there are tons of events here. And the key is to not do all of them, but to find your audience and do the right ones that, that fit you. My main problem is that I always go, how did I not hear about this? Why didn't I get, I always hear about it like when it's happening and then it's like, oh, I forgot. Or even like the next year, it's like, I have to remember next year to do this. And then it's like, I forgot to remember this year to do this. Spreadsheets and Google Calendar. I've just put stuff on there. This is when this app is going to come out. This is when it's due. But yeah, I think too, if you're, if you're active enough on your Instagram and Facebook and you follow all of these people, you're going to see it and people are gonna be talking about it. I don't know, I I haven't gotten to the point yet where I've missed something and I'm like, oh man. My first year I just did a couple holiday shows and then that was when I kind of tried to pay more attention. The places around town that you sell your stuff, like businesses and stuff, uh, how many many would you say do or is it just the one place? I just have the two places right now. Booth 121, I have a lot of the embroidered portraits and things. And I just started selling some embroidered jewelry over at Zip Dang on Monroe Street. Just kind of like these big clunky rings full of French knots. I'm not aware of these. What's that? Yeah, it's new. And that's what I mean is like you try to stick to things that are your brand to not confuse people. But then you also don't want to go crazy making the same things all the time. So I just tried making these jewelry pieces and I thought they turned out really cool. And so I threw them on my table over the holidays and people loved them. And Natalie at Zip Dang came to one of the shows I was selling at and she liked them and so I gave her some to put out. So I have a little bit of jewelry out there. How do you promote yourself or do you promote yourself at all? I'm not great at promoting myself. I would say that's definitely one of my weak points and I think that that is something that requires a lot of time and energy and almost an entirely different business plan is to figure out how to do that effectively. I think a lot of people really rely on social media and I kind of do. I, you know, I throw stuff out there, but I feel like that's the way I show people what I'm working on that's new is through social media. Otherwise, the best way to promote yourself, I think, is doing in-person shows because they meet you. And if there's a face to your business or to your product, people remember you. Do you do email at all, like an email list? That's on my list of things to do, too. I signed up, I think, for you know the MailChimp thing, but I haven't done it because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like a whole other thing. <laughs> well, yes, I think you actually said it perfectly, is the new stuff, Facebook and, and all that and the social media, but kind of welcoming people and introducing them to yourself is definitely through email because, well, they're not going to search your Facebook to go, okay, I'm going to figure this person out. So let's, let's look at their history. No, I mean, you can welcome them with an email going, this is how I started and hopefully right. you like it. Right. And you know what? I kind of forgot about, or maybe I blocked it out and repressed it already. I had a blog. That was really that was really how I first started all of this nonsense. And you know what? This is funny. And I'm telling you this because my mom will never hear it because she doesn't know what podcasts are. But I had this WordPress blog and I was like really telling my story and explaining like each project and what it meant to me and why I did it. And I got like 
two or three years into this blog and I made a lot of great connections on WordPress. Like I met a local person here and we met up and we stitched together and it was amazing. But anyway, I was doing this blog and like I got this notification one day that my mom started following me. That was the end of that. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Not because I couldn't like you know, drop my F-bombs or talk the way that I want to talk, but it's because I'm telling these stories that I'm like, I'm not sure I want to share with my family because there's like a chasm between us sometimes and I have to be careful about how to bridge that. And so it just got into my head. It messed with me. And I kept thinking, I'm going to go back and do this blog. It's not like I'm saying anything I don't want them to read, but it got to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, it ended up being like a year since I had a post and I went back and I was like, ah, I'm just going to delete it. So I deleted the whole blog. Oh, you lost the history. No, I kind of regret that because she already saw all the stuff that was there. It's not like I was hiding it from her. Now you can't reuse it. You I can't, but I also felt like that was just the end of an era and it was time to move on. But yeah, that's my pathetic blog story. <laughs> But really, blogging, I think it, people think of it as like this antiquated way of um, being online or, or having an online presence. But I, I think there's something to it. And there's so many free blogging sites that it kind of is a great way to just throw your story out there if you want to write. And that's what I found about Instagram is it's like, oh, my God, thank God I don't have to write. Well, how did you come up with the name? Um, I sat down with a notebook and I made a list of things that kind of felt fun, but I wanted the name to actually say what I do so that that wouldn't confuse people. So I had a whole list and some of them were already taken. So you kind of look and see if there are businesses out there. And that was the winner. Stitch, boom, bang. I like that. Yeah. So what other things do you have going on in the future? Is there any projects? You know, I'm just trying to find time to do some personal stuff. And now that the weather is warmer, I'm also hoping to get out and do some more street art type of things. Last summer, I started the doily affair. And I'm taking like doilies and linens that I can't use for sale purposes because they're they have holes or whatever in them. And I just embroider something on them and post it out in the world. And that was kind of an outlet for me with the whole political climate right now. I did some kind of snarky things that I wouldn't ever try to sell, but it was a way for me to get it out of my system a little bit. Some of those are still hanging around on the on the Near East side, near, like by where I live, but I, I would love to learn how to wheat paste and ruin some things in the neighborhood. I find Madison to be kind of hard to meet people who want to like team up and tackle things together. There are a lot of people who kind of want to stay in their own corners. So I'm kind of trying to meet people who want to get out there and do some collaborative projects too. That's on my list. I'd like to team up with somebody. I've met some people who are interested in it, but making it happen can be hard because people are busy. But my, I'm hoping my summer project will be more stuff that I just kind of hang. And I really like the idea of like found art and leaving things for people to find around town. I think that's kind of fun too. I think a lot of artists put their stuff out and will post on Instagram, this is here at this location, go get it. I like that idea of putting stuff out for people, even if they want it and they just didn't want to buy it or for whatever reason, you know, it is about being paid because as an artist, I think we're not paid or even offered to be paid nearly frequently enough. But there's also a point where you kind of want to just put your stuff out there for no reason and make somebody smile. On an unrelated note, is there an EMT crew behind me right now? <laughs> oh my God, there is. What's happening? I didn't want to turn around because I don't want to be rude, but I'm like, I keep seeing EMT people walk by. I can kind of look over your shoulder and I don't know what's happening, but there is a giant stretcher and it does not look good. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, we'll... we'll what do we do? I'm not entirely sure. I know. I want to. Be, I want. I want to give them their privacy, but at the same time, I totally want to know what's going on. I don't want to be that person on the highway that still slows down. I think we're okay. Okay. We're okay. They're, they're getting her onto the stretcher, and okay. she's standing. We're okay. 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 Good. Heather talked about how she likes to leave things around town. Well, she recently started doing that with a zine of her own called Chicken Jelly. And since talking to her, she has made a couple of issues and set them in different places around town and posted it on Instagram. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. 
The music for this show is by Lorenzo's Music, which you can learn more about at lorenzosmusic.com. Until next time, so long.